Welcome back to the Iron Insight. Thank you for starting your week off right with the Iron Insight every Monday morning at 4 a.m. I'm Bryn Welds. And I'm Andrew Nichols with Southern Leather Works, the co-host. Mr. James, how are you doing this morning? I'm great, guys. It's always a good day. It's always a good day. That's what we like to hear. Well, it's a nice Saturday where I'm at. I don't know about you guys, but I'm looking forward to this episode. It's, uh, it's Husker game day here in Nebraska, the first one of the season, <laughs> so I'm pretty pumped to get all these episodes knocked out. And then, uh, yeah, and James, I spoke to you on the phone once, but we uh, that was about the Globe, if you remember that, the Globe project yeah. I was working on. Man, that thing turned out super nice, super nice. Yeah. yeah. I kind we, of we, the struggles that went into that thing, like looking at it and knowing what equipment you had, it, uh, it hurts my brain. Yeah, and then I look at some of the stuff that you work on, and I'm like, man, I don't know how he does this. I – I came into that project and it was already a year in. So most of the the sphere itself was built already out of pipes. But my first day they say, hey, pick up this quarter inch stainless steel continent and use this Harbor Freight central machinery English wheel and form it to fit that globe. And I said, I never used an English wheel. And they said, oh, well, go watch an Eastwood uh, YouTube video. (laughs) (laughs) Trial by fire. Yeah. (laughs) That's how that went. And we ended up outsourcing it to a, a well, just the forming of the continents to a company in Minnesota. And I had never heard of this uh, technique, but what they did was they spun it with, uh, it's like a, the way I would describe it, I don't know the technicalities. It's like a huge lathe. I'm sure you're familiar with it where they put kind of a bead roller on it and form it to that. So it's, it's what I'm, I think I know what you're talking about. It's the same way that they form like symbols for drum kits, I believe. Um, but man, for quarter inch stainless, I mean, that's that's some big equipment that they got. Yeah, they they sent us a video. Uh, I'll send it to you later. They're they're cool. It's what we did was we pretty much just cut out a huge stainless circle and and they formed it from there. And then we took a bunch of thinner material and made stencils and then drew it on and cut it out by hand with a plasma cutter and cleaned up the edges and stuff like that. Uh, That works. That's a, it's a hell of a project to start on at a new shop. I mean, no, no pressure, right? (laughs) (laughs) It's uh, yeah, it's going to the VFW and it's kind of caused some controversy in, in our city. Like my buddy's a bartender at a, a private club here and he had a guy in there the other day who I'm familiar with and he was talking crap about the globe. He was saying, Oh, the VFW should be giving all this money back to the veterans. And it's like, well, our labor is our donation and the material is donated by alter metal recycling here in Grand Island, Nebraska. So there is no money going into it from the VFW, just time. Man, that's the thing. It's, It's easy for people on the outside looking in to make assumptions and then run with those assumptions and get all in their feelings and yeah, not, not even taking the time to like find out the truth of the matter. Yeah. uh, Yeah. Something I wonder about with uh, like assumptions and people looking in is I heard, I don't know for a fact, but I heard that you had a TV show, uh in your shop (laughs) (laughs) yeah so the the shop i managed i mean man i'm coming coming up to two years of my being full-time for myself um before that i was managing a big shop uh for close to eight years and we did a show we did one season on discovery channel and then the show kind of changed direction and we did a couple of seasons on motor trend um and it was primarily because you know we we're building stuff for like gordon ramsay steph curry um i don't know if you guys have whataburger i know it, the chain has like grown outside of texas some but it's fast food hamburgers. We built a truck for Whataburger. Um, we built a couple of trucks, food trucks for Kevin Hart. Because of that clientele, we had a show. So it was a reality build show. 
uh, never really took off. Honestly, I'm not about that life. <laughs> I just want to be able to put my hood on and uh, build some cool stuff. And having to work around a production crew schedule doesn't really allow for a cohesive workday. Um, you know, we're in, in Texas. You know, what is it? Right now it's almost 8 o'clock and we're already hitting, getting close to 90 degrees. So in a bigger shop environment, you know, the goal is get in there early, leave early, so you kind of beat the heat. Um, camera crews don't get there that early. They want to rock up at 9.30, 10 o'clock. When they're ready to start filming, it's, you know, the middle of the day. Um, you know, and then the other side of it, being a reality show, they want to create all this drama. <laughs> and again, like, I managed that shop, and for the most part, it was drama free. I mean, we had 120 employees, but as a manager, you pick the right people so that your teams work well together and there is no drama for the most part, for the most part. Um, but they try and script stuff. I mean, I remember they would hand me scripts and be like, read this. And I'll like, read, I'd skim through it. I'm like, no, that, that's not how I talk. I don't care if I'm not filming. Like, well, you have to be like, you're running the shop. It's like, yeah, I just, I don't care. That's, that's it. I'm not about that life. Um, I want to build cool stuff with like-minded people and have fun doing it. And shows just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, along with that script part, I saw, I, I did scroll back into your uh, Instagram and I did see a clip where like, there was like an ice cream cone melted inside of a truck or something. And they, they made a big deal out of that. I'd assume like stuff like that they're doing on purpose, you know. So that, that ice, those ice creams and stuff, they were in there. And I don't know for how long, like, I mean, at least that, that vehicle had been sitting for 10 years. Uh, that was for LA Dodgers. And that was old stock from when that vehicle had been operational, um, like 10 years prior. And yeah, they, they scripted it in to get one of the guys to eat it. And I mean, that's just nasty. Yeah, that's even disgusting. With the, <laughs> yeah, even with all the preservatives that is in food these days, it's still got to get a little funky inside that packet. Um, yeah, it, it was wild. Some of the stuff, I mean, some shops are a little more lax on safety, et cetera. Um, that shop definitely pushed the boundaries. I think, one, because of the show, uh, to create a buzz and some wow factor. Um you know, while we're doing it and the show was airing, I got a lot of messages about you guys shouldn't be doing this, you guys shouldn't be doing that. Um, I agree, but you know, a lot of it was out of my control. And um, to, to there were some upsides though, you know, like when we delivered Steph Curry's uh, build, I got to take my son with me and we got to play one on one with Steph Curry, which. <laughs> I mean, dude, that was father of the year points right there. Oh, yeah. You won it right there. You're, you're yeah. good. <laughs> Living in San Antonio, you know, it's, it's the Spurs are the, the pride of the city. My son has always been a Golden State fan. So you get a lot of grief going to school wearing a Golden State jersey. So, you know, you jump forward, and for him to actually get to play ball with Curry and meet him, it made all that grief that he received over the years worth it, you know? So, uh, <laughs> well, it's funny that you meant, yeah. It's funny that you mentioned um, how the reality TV show is, you know, it was that way in your shop too. Cause I grew up watching, you know, Orange County, OCC choppers and, you know, gas funky garage. And you could always tell they cr tried to create a, you know, drama, like you said. And I can't imagine that works out great in a shop full of welders. I mean, I really don't know what they, they were thinking. But it's funny to hear it from your point of view. You can have the most level-headed, calm, collected guys, but human nature is human nature. You push people too far and, you know, alter egos and pride comes out. And 
you, know, you never know what's going to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you were you were managing a shop of 120 people, right? And yeah. So how did you get your start to to build up your career that far to be managing overseeing 120 uh, shop employees? So I when I first moved, well. Growing up in Australia, I grew up on a dairy farm. Um, so, you know, from like six, seven, eight years old, stick welding, you know, doing farm repairs. Um, never really considered it welding because it was just make it stick, make it hold. You know, it wasn't until I moved over to the US, uh, moved to Colorado, I got a job as a, uh, a bicycle mechanic for a pro mountain bike team and did a couple of seasons with them as you know, traveling around Colorado as a pro mechanic company that sponsored that team. All they did was build custom titanium bicycle frames. Um, so I kind of got tired of traveling around as a mechanic and I rocked up to that main sponsor and I was like, Hey, I want a job. I want to learn how to weld want to learn how to build frames and like, well, we're not really hiring. I was like, I'll work for free for a week, just sweeping your floors, taking trash out, whatever, and give me a shot. And I was like, all right. After the first week, they gave me a job and I mean, Monday, you know, forklift, unloading, tubing, et cetera. Eventually they started, they put me through an apprenticeship because they also did a lot of work for Boeing. Uh, mm. Because Boeing, same titanium for hydraulic lines, etc. So they put me through the apprenticeship. Um, I was there for a couple of years, and then I got offered a job in San Antonio, like late 2000s, when NASA had a huge space budget. Um, so I moved down to San Antonio to be a contract welder for NASA. Got to build some super cool stuff. Um, and then NASA's space budget went away. And I had to go back to the real world. Now, keep in mind, at this point in my welding career, I'd welded chromoly, stainless, um, magnesium, and titanium. And rock up to a normal welding shop. They asked me to take a MIG test. And I said, I've never MIG welded. <laughs> so, <laughs> They kind of found a job for me, TIG welding, uh, aluminum and stuff. And I ran with that and I was essentially for the next like four or five years, just a table welder, um, started getting burnt out on it and no disrespect to people that sit at a table all day. Um, it just, I got burnt out on it. So I decided <laughs> to become a fabricator that could weld and started playing around with sheet metal, bending tubing, just learning as much as I could and kind of went through a phase where I wanted to get back into bikes. So I opened my own custom bike shop, building frames in Austin out of titanium, carbon, carbon fiber, and uh, aluminum magnesium. Did it for a while, got itchy feet again, went back to a production shop and management kind of had a big shift and they put me in charge of the weld shop and that was kind of like the that was where my management career started growing because then from that shop i moved to a bigger shop you know a couple of bigger shops just building my resume um and then a few years after you know, kind of hopping around the sh Bigger shop I was managing before I opened my own business, they were hiring welders and fabricators. So I applied because it was 10 minute walk from my house at the time. Um, decent, you know, decent compensation. So after a year, they're like, Hey, we want you to manage the shop and help us grow it. So I did. When I started, there was probably like 20 people there. Um, and then, yeah, you jump forward six, seven years when I left and there were, they had a couple of locations, about 120 employees. For me, the, the 
turning point of leaving and starting my own shop was quality of life. Uh, welding and fabrication is my therapy. When you're managing, it doesn't matter if you're managing 20 people, 50 people, 100 plus, you become a therapist, a financial advisor. Um, you, you start wearing too many hats and it was taking me away from my therapy, which is welding and fabrication. And it was taking, most importantly, it taking me away from my family. Um, so took the plunge, opened my own shop. Did I start working less hours? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, you know, when you start your own business, it's the hardest relationship you're ever going to have in your life. Um, because even when you're managing a business, when you leave to some degree, you get to leave it at the door when you leave. Uh, but when you've got your own business, that's not, not the case. So I was moving on this. So I'm still working 80 plus hours a week, but it's a different kind of stress because I know it's building something for my family, you know, and I've got the flexibility. I'm 10 minutes from the house. If my wife wants to bring the kids to the shop for lunch to break the day up, you know, it's, it's a win-win. Um, we're opening a second shop in the same business park and it's got a bunch of office space in the front. So we've already dedicated one of those offices for my wife, uh, cause she handles the accounting ordering, et cetera, et cetera, on top of her full-time job that she already has. Um, uh, but connected to that office, there's a, another office that's going to be the kids playroom for when they come and hang out at the shop. Um, Everyone's got a different mentality, but for me, it, it really is a family business. Do I want my children to become welders, fabricators? Not necessarily. <laughs> but if they genuinely want to and they enjoy it, then I'll support it. Um, you know, like my oldest son, he, he just started college. At an earlier age, he showed a lot of interest in welding and he loved coming to the shop, the, whatever shop I was working at, making stuff, etc. And it kind of pushed him towards mechanical engineering. Well, then by the time he finished high school, he diverted from mechanical engineering and got into computer science. Um, would I like to work with him? Yeah, but he's found his path and his part in life. So I'm all for it. Um, but it is a family business. If the kids want to be involved, that's great. If they don't, that's also That's also just fine. <laughs> so. And how old were you when you, when you first moved over here to Colorado? Uh, I was, so I'm, I'm old. I'm old. I'm 48 <laughs> now. Uh, I was, late twenties, like 28. Um, you know, yeah, probably 28. Over here. What made you decide to leave Australia and come to the U S? Um, so I was going, I went to school for outdoor education, but I always raced BMX, mountain bikes, motocross. And, you know, I did want to get into the custom, custom frame building. But the industry in Australia is too small to support, uh, you know, a career for it. So moved over here. Um, it was calculated. You know, I moved over here to get a job as a mechanic for a team. It just so happened that the first team I got a job with led me to that, that frame builder, bicycle frame builder, which that was my goal. Um, so, you know, I took, took a wrong turn, if you will, and got into aerospace, um, but then returned to it, had my own shop building frames. It was good for a few years, but it just, it wasn't enough for to keep me happy. Um, welding, you know, the welding industry here is so much bigger, especially the specialized welding and fabrication industry is so much bigger here than it is in Australia. Um, you know, geographically, Australia is almost the same size as the U.S., but we've only got 10% of the population of the U.S. 
So it was, you know, calculated to come over here and achieve that goal. I marked it off my list and then just kind of ran with the rest of it. So you, you mentioned the heat earlier, right, in Texas, but you decided, well, I guess you took the, the NASA job in uh, San Antonio, but Texas has to be the most like Australia state in the U S when it comes to it, <laughs> with, without a doubt, it's not, you know, it's not just the heat, but the landscape and people's attitudes, you know, I've, I've been lucky. I've got to visit a lot of the U S since I've been here. Um, for the most part, Texas is a lot like central Queensland and the Northern territory where I spent a lot of my time. So, I mean, it really has become, I don't want to say it, my family at home obviously weren't here, but Texas has become home. Uh, <laughs> I still go back every so often and my accent's all jacked up now, but I go back home and within a couple of days, I sound Australian again. Um, <laughs> but you know, when I first moved over here, I had a lot stronger accent. I actually started hiding it because I'd try and get a coffee in the morning and it would turn into a half hour conversation about, do you know the crocodile hunter? Do you know Steve Irwin? Do you ride a kangaroo to school? Um, <laughs> I even had people ask me, how long did it take you to learn English when you moved here? <laughs> uh, you know? <laughs> uh, so I, I consciously started hiding the accent just so I could go about my day to day I mean, it's not that I, I don't like talking to people, but I, every day I have my list of things I want to achieve, a half hour conversation about things that are just stupid doesn't always fit into my day. So, yeah, that, that opens my eyes and makes me feel a little bit bad for this uh, Australian fellow that came into our shop a couple months ago or no, not Australian, Irish, because I went to Ireland for a month, uh, two years ago this month. And, um, man, I picked his ear for about two hours. He came in when I was on lunch and our shop's super flexible with, with our lunch. You know, you got to go home and do this, meet the HVAC guy here or whatever. Yeah. You can take a two hour lunch or something like that. And awesome. I picked this, this Irish fellow's ear for about two hours. And I think it's, because of the podcast, it's almost like every conversation I get into, I'm starting a full podcast with these random people I meet. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a bad thing. I mean, you know, that gives you the opportunity to really learn about somebody. And I mean, you learn something from everybody's experiences in life. So it's an education, if you will. <laughs> yeah. that's So uh, right. where at in Australia was the, uh, the dairy farm you grew up on? So dairy farm was actually southeast corner in uh, just outside of Melbourne. Um, the governments are governments, and they they do their thing. They kind of screwed over the dairy industry, where it was just impossible to make money. So we sold that farm and we moved up to the Northern Territory, um, which you know we were nine hours to the closest grocery store, so we're pretty much self sufficient on our farm. Uh, I was at that point, I was like 12 years old. We we're on a 3000 acre farm up there, which as a 12 year old, I thought it was huge. Uh, yeah. my sister, sister and I had a little Suzuki Samurai that dad built for us <laughs> with school by correspondence. So we figured out pretty quick. We get up early, do our chores, knock out our schoolwork by 10 30, 11 o'clock each day. We were free to do whatever we want. We'd cruise around our property in this little samurai. Um, but then, you know, you jump forward to now and yeah, 3000 acres is big, but our neighbors had over 200,000 acres on one side behind us. They had you know over 300,000 acres. Um, and when it was, came time to muster cattle, we were out there in trucks and on horseback mustering our cattle. Our neighbors all around us, they were doing helicopters. Uh, we were doing a little, <laughs> little, little fish. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I mean, as a kid growing up, it was a 
heck of an experience. It wouldn't change it for the world. Absolutely. Here, here's probably a question you get uh, pretty often too that might be annoying. But the wildlife in Australia, you see pictures of these huge spiders. How often would would you come about a spider like that? Out, uh, it's pretty common. I mean, you know, in in a city, you don't see them a whole lot. But the moment you're on the outskirts of the city or in rural areas, yeah, you see them all the time. Yeah. Um, my mom's property before she passed away, she had 20 acres. And there was a mango orchard behind the house and in between those mango trees there were these massive spider webs and they were bird eating spiders so their bodies the bodies on these spiders you know would be like this big um that is the worst feeling you walk through one of those webs when it's dark or early in the morning and it's <laughs> there's not a um yeah you see you see all the you know the spiders the snakes everything but i mean it's, it's like texas there's rattlesnakes everywhere but if you're not out there looking for them and looking to mess with them they do their thing you do your thing for the most part yeah um, you know, i've had a couple of a couple of snakes come into the shop when i've been here late at night thankfully there's been little uh you know, little brown snakes but when you've got your hood on and you're welding underneath a vehicle, you don't know what it is. You're still going to freak out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you, you've been on your own for two years, you said? Yeah. And you you just expanded your shop, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. What did you first start with on your own? So I started, I mean, I started in the garage like a lot of people do. Um you know, I had my two, not regular two car garage. Um, I had my five by 10 plasma table in there. I've got you know, my tubing, tubing bender, English wheel, um, 10 foot brake. I had everything jammed in. There. Um, you know, if I needed to use my plasma, I had to spend like an hour pulling a bunch of stuff out so I could get to the table. Um, you make it work. I mean, there was definitely, definitely didn't create an efficient workspace, but you work with what you have, like, like a lot of people do. Um, and it got to a point where I had enough workflow. So I rented a shop, um, ghetto, ghetto shop, ghetto area. Um, it was like 30, 33 cents a square foot, which not sure how much real estate is where you guys are, but here 33 cents a square foot is dirt cheap. Um, but at that business park, as soon as, you know, six, seven o'clock came around and started getting dark, you'd have all these people just come out of the woodwork. Um, it's a lot of speculation that they liked to party and they were under the influence of certain things. Um, you know, I'd work late nights and I'd lift my hood up and there'd be people in my shop that I didn't know. So always have the doors open. And it just, it became a security issue as far as whether I was there or not. So just kept pushing and created enough of a customer base that I could upgrade my shop. Um, I started, my main focus when I started was going to be support or contract welding for machine shops, etc. cetera. Um, but then took another tangent. I was building aluminum mini jet boats for a while there. Uh, and then that market just kind of got flooded. So yeah, they're flo know. they're flooded right now. You see them everywhere. It, it's, which, you know, it, it took the value out of a shop doing them versus somebody doing them at home in their garage. Um, someone with zero overhead versus somebody that has rent insurance etc um so you know the first year in the nicer shop as far as workflow i was taking in anything and everything just to get money in the door and that was actually a huge mistake so you kind of when you're 
scope of work is too large and somebody asks you what you do, well, I do this, this, and this, and this. They then look at you and like, well, what are you specializing? And because your scope is so large, you can't narrow down your clientele. Um, but then because I was also so hungry to get money in the door, if somebody said, well, that's too expensive, I was way too quick to discount the price, uh, which was you know, devaluing my time and my skill set. Uh, so you know, even though I've got that management, shop management background, to some degree, all of that goes out the window when you open your own shop. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's your money, it's your name. So, you know, you have to pivot. And over the last two years, I've pivoted a lot. I've failed a lot, but I've also pivoted a lot. Um, it's been a roller coaster. Roller coaster is not over <laughs> by any means. Um, but I'm starting to see sustainable growth in the business. Yeah, two years yeah, two. is impressive, especially with you opening this second shop, uh, now a production yeah. shop. So I ended up flipping, seeing that's another pivot. The second shop was going to be the production shop, but then I flipped it. A new shop is now actually going to be the clean clean shop, so primarily final assembly, um, clean controlled environment for the, you know, the continued aerospace work that I do for local shops. The original shop is now a dirty steel grinding uh, plasma table. And it, it's nice, you know, like in the original shop now, we've got 200 assemblies that we're doing for a local, a new power plant that's being uh, built. And then in the new shop, I've got a Tundra that I'm building, a Tundra marketing vehicle that I'm building. Um, I had a Porsche race car in there yesterday that just did a quick, quick fix on so we can get to the track today. And then he'll bring it back next week so we can actually get rid of the band aid fix and you know, do a proper proper fix on the exhaust um, and it, it's in that new shop the front front area there's a massive lobby where massive lobby with all the office space uh, so we're actually going to set up a little retail store essentially um, we stock Everlast welding machines uh, edge welding cups benchmark abrasives and I'll work on a few other few other brands um, you know, San Antonio is a big city, like close to 2 million people you can throw a rock and hit about 10 different welders. <laughs> uh, some are professional, some are not, but as a whole, the welding supply stores here don't carry a lot of TIG welding stuff and they don't carry a lot of higher end, uh, you know, MIG and fabrication stuff. It's really geared towards your, your pipe welders which I respect more than anything because I, I never did it. I can't grow a beard. I've been trying for 48 years and it's about <laughs> the best. Um, I respect them, but that's what most of the shops around here are geared towards. So, you know, is it going to be 20 people coming every day to buy stuff? Probably not, but it'll just complement what we do as a whole. Uh, I mean, you walk into my shop, I've probably got 10 Everlast machines in here. So I have a lot of big and small companies coming to look at the Everlast machines. And I'll let them demo them and then obviously, you know, refer them to, hey, this is a machine you should get. Um, so far, it's worked out well. If, if nothing else, then... I've got my own retail store of consumables that I can use in my shop. And the guys yeah. can just, you know, <laughs> go grab themselves. <laughs> but, you know, like any business, you've got to take some risks to grow. So I think with a little bit of marketing, uh, local marketing, whether grassroots or a little, you know, higher, I think we can turn some products for the local, local businesses, big and small. Huh. 
Yeah, that that welding supply store, especially, I mean, you mentioned Edge and Everlast. You're on both of those teams. Uh, we actually yeah. got brought in at the same time to Edge, I think, right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, that was something I wasn't expecting uh, to get brought in, really, because honestly, I hadn't used that many edge uh products i used the mig nozzle because i couldn't tig weld i was like 16 years old and um i made a video on the mig nozzle and i was like trashing it this. yeah trashing like, it this. who wants a, a glass mig nozzle right and they they messaged me well if you if you think it's so bad tell us what the cons are so we can fix it and i was like instant respect for this company i mean that's just not something very common that a, nah. that a company would say. They'd be like, all right, block, you know? And so that's pretty cool that you're going to be able to sell the products that you're on the teams of. And, uh, and that's, you know, like, like you said, I mean, Stacia and Eric, they're, they're so good and so genuine. Only Jesse, Mark, at Everlast, same thing. As cliche as it is, that, you know, support those that support you. Um, you know, I've had issues on a Friday where I've got in a bind and I've needed something from Everlast and they make it happen. It'll be here the Saturday morning. Right. Try doing that with some of the other bigger companies. They don't <laughs> care. Yeah. Customer service is a lost art for most of these companies once they grow to a certain size. Edge, Everlast, I mean, the people behind the brands are just, they're phenomenal. You can't go wrong. Yeah. And when you call into Everlast, if you got a problem, you're talking to Mark Winchester or Jesse McCollum. And Mark Winchester, I mean, grade A, grade A plus customer service. We, oh, yeah, you you talked to him on the phone. I've, I've talked to him, dude. Absolutely great because I was having an issue with my 275 Lightning. Um, and I was like, yeah, you know, I just wanted to call. It's making this issue. I'm on the road working right now. I can't get to the machine. I just wanted to call before my warranty was up. And he's like. Oh, just just call me when you get back to the shop. You're we'll, we'll honor the warranty. Don't worry about it. And sure enough, which you know you you won't get that you won't get that anywhere else. I mean, those two guys. Yeah, and it, it, what's that? Go they ahead. they know they know the machines because they use them in the workplace as well. Versus somebody that's looking at a manual, reading through the specs that you probably know more about the machine than they do. Right. That's true. Um, that makes a huge difference in itself. And I, mean, I think a lot of us aspire to be able to weld aluminum as good as Winchester and McCall. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's funny though because they have different styles. Uh, Jesse Jesse said this was before my time, like uh, in the community, the social media welding community. And Jesse was saying when we had him on the podcast that uh, they used to ha hate each other and go at each other's throats over using a diffuser or a gas lens or just a, a call yeah. body. And I find it funny because I'll message them both for the, for the same problem I'm having and they'll give two completely different answers and I'll try them both yeah. and see which one works. <laughs> I know what I'm going to do the rest of the day. I'm going to start poking that one a little bit between the two of them. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's fun. It's definitely fun. And with the Everlast as well, I mean, those two are top 1% welders at, at least like, and you're calling in for those guys for technical support, you would never, you would get somebody trained on the manual, like you said. And if you're calling in about like a typhoon, two thirty, three thirty, or 500, those two developed the machine inside and out. Yeah. And they did a man. I am so impressed. You know, I recently late to the party, but recently got a three thirty typhoon three thirty, And I've probably explored maybe 20% of its features. Um, it's a game changer. You know, and I used to run the blue machines that had the monopoly on the aluminum TIG market. Typhoon leaves it, leaves it far behind. Um, you know, I had some dirty oxidized aluminum and adjusting the amplitude, I mean, it came out looking like it was fresh material from a mill. Hmm. Uh, as I said, I've only, ex only explored like 20% of its features. Uh, but yeah, it's a game changer. They did such a good job with that machine. It's 
It's funny you say that because I work at a, a – it was a tool and die shop for like 40-something years, and then they just opened a fabrication side uh, three years ago. And so working at a tool and die and mold builder shop, a lot of the material that comes to me is milled surfaces, so that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's a waste of time for sure to be milling everything that they do, but, you know, it's not a huge shop. It's 80, 89 people I think now. So, okay. uh, but which is still a decent size. Yeah, it's the fabrication size is definitely uh, pretty small compared to the tool and die. But I mean, like I said, they started as a tool and die shop in 1978. But yeah, that's funny. I would love to get my hands on a typhoon, and uh, it's it sucked because it got delivered, but then this bigger job big steel job kind of landed in my lap. I was so busy getting it all squared away and lining people up to do the work that I didn't get to unbox and set the typhoon up for like five days. And I thought past <laughs> it. It was hurting my heart a little bit seeing it sit there in the boxes. Um, so I actually went home for dinner with the family one night and then we put the kids to bed and I was like, all right, I'm running back to the shop. I'm going to go set this thing up. And, you know, got here at like 10, played around setting that thing up. I think it, you know, I looked at my watch and it was like 2.30. I was like, all right, I'm going to go home and get some sleep before I start the day. But, you know, it's like a kid at Christmas. I had to, and it was just, it was well worth it. Don't get me wrong. I put it through its paces. And you talked a little bit about some of the aerospace work that you do. And... This is something I've been wondering as we're looking into a laser welder at our shop. We have a stationary one if we need to, if the tool maker messes up and we have to add a couple thousands to a corner on a mold or something like that. But the handheld ones is something we don't have. And I was wondering if you would be allowed to laser weld uh, aerospace parts yet, even though there's very minimal regulation and codes on laser welding. So most of the work I get um, you know, the call out for the well procedure is 17, you know, 17, one D 17, one, uh, which specifies T. So you know, for a lot of the stuff I do, unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to, um, but I think as, you know, as laser welders are developed more, I mean, you look at the last. You look at how the advancements in the last year, you know, you've gone from your Amazon and Timu, uh, you know, $1,500 laser welders to <laughs> legit units out there that actually function the way they were designed to. I think as they gain more and more traction, you're going to see updates in the call outs. But at the same time, I'll get a stack of prints for some parts that, you know, the prints, the date, origin, the original revision of that print goes back to the seventies, you know, and I'm sure you guys see it as well with some of the stuff, um, you know, that original print may be from the seventies, but then it gets updated, um, you know, whatever well procedure, the original well procedure, it gets updated to you know, D 1.1 T and that was a new one for me because I always thought of 1.1 as just structural steel, stick, flux core, MIG. Um, but I get a lot of prints that call D 1.1 T. So you know, I'm lucky. I've got a good CWI that comes down when I need testing, um, makes it painless. And if I fail, you know, he lets me down easily. If I, if I pass, Oh, it's a bonus. Um, but yeah, D1.1 in TIG has been a really good one for me because there's a lot of old weld procedures that call it out. Yeah. And when it comes to the welding supply store, are you thinking about supplying gases as well? Nah. I probably, uh, there's, I mean, if anything, like the, the, there's a mom and pop store that I get my bottles from because um, their pricing is way better than your air gases, your Matheson's. 
But the biggest thing for me with them is they actually purge their bottles correctly. So I've never had a bad bottle of gas from them. Mm. Um, if I need a custom mix of like helium, argon, I can tell them that I want 72.9% argon and they'll do it. I, I believe that they're doing it right because obviously I can't test it. <laughs> yeah, I can tell, tell to some degree how it welds, but if anything, I would get bottles from them and have them have, have it here and just work out some sort of, but I don't think I really want to mess with the whole hazmat side of it. The, the supply store is really just a way to subsidize some of my rent. Um, so selling machines and stuff, you know, that, that's easy. Uh, especially when I have so many of the Everlast machines in the shop, let someone run it and it's pretty much a guaranteed sale. Um, the gas bottles thing, as I said, yeah, the hazmat, everything else that is involved with that, it's probably not worth the investment. Yeah. Um, you know, I know without a doubt I'd have to get a sprinkler system put in the shop. Maybe it's different in other states, but sprinkler systems in Texas cost you a fortune. Oh, they're expensive down here in Florida, too. They're bad. One of our mine and Andrew and I's welding instructors, uh, John Wilmus, he owned seven welding supply stores in throughout central and western Nebraska. And he was telling us um, he would go home at night and have a truck out delivering gas bottles of gas and acetylene and stuff like that. And he would be worried in his head all night, you know, it would keep him up worrying about that truck driver and those bottles of gas. And he told us a story one time, Andrew, you might remember better than, than I do, but some, there was a shop where an acetylene bottle like blew off the valve and there was like a 20 foot flame and they yep. got lucky that it was a pitched roof. And, um, he said he was looking, they were blaming his bottle for failing, but it was, I think it was something with the regulator or uh or sucked back it could have been the uh flame could have got sucked back i think is what it was yeah there was no uh flame or there's no arresters on it is That's what right. i think he is what he ended up proving there was no arresters on it yeah and how he proved that was they you know they were blaming him as the flame was still active and everybody was evacuated but there was an overhead door open to it and he had binoculars and he was standing there with the the owner of the shop <clears throat> and the firefighters looking at it waiting for that flame to die down and that's what he said and that saved his ass so you know you could only imagine what would happen with that liability if he didn't if he wasn't able to catch that oh man that that, that would shut you down yeah yeah see that's a good example i mean it just so solidifies yeah i don't want to mess with gas yeah, <laughs> yeah. do you have any uh do you have any welding hoods in your supply store yet not yet no no. I was, I was going to ask, uh, well, adding on to that, if you were, if you were to put hoods in there, what hoods would you run in there? And I was also going to ask how many Sentinels you have, because I saw a picture with three of them on your, uh, Instagram. So I, I've got, I got six Sentinels. Um, I've always loved them. They've always worked well. Um, I've noticed lately, though, they don't seem to, the screens don't seem to be lasting as long. Uh, it's, they're a little more, it's almost like they're a little more fragile. Um, hmm. Not to be a conspiracy theorist, but it kind of seems to tie in with when ESA became a publicly traded company. Hmm. I didn't even know they were dropping quality since then uh as far as what i would stock i don't know honestly i mean i i need to do a little more market research and see what people are running around here um because even though i like sentinel if they're not going to sell it doesn't make sense to stock them um but i need you know i'd like to have some entry-level hoods so maybe like selstrom um, but then also have some nicer stuff as well. Well, if you're looking for some entry level, uh, flip lens hoods, that's what I make. Um, I mean, it's more of, I guess the pipe welding hoods. You have your, 
chop down hood with leather on it, more of a compact style, but I can do custom branding and logoing and stuff. So if you wanted to sell your own, you know, custom logo welding hood, we could definitely do something like that. I've been trying to get into more welding supply shops. I just haven't found anybody that said yes yet. So if you wanted to work something out for some entry level hoods, I, I think I make a decent entry level hood. Yeah, we definitely need to talk them for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I've provided, well, Bryn set it up, like he said, 60 welding hoods to um, students at our old school that we both went to um, because they just used the crappy. It was like Lincoln Viking fixed shade lens, and we were able to upgrade them to those, and uh, they liked them. So, Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm for it. They, Absolutely. There was no reason for us not to donate those hoods because what they would give us, it was a, it was a Miller. I have a video on it cause I got my first, uh, auto darkening hood and I was freaking out because, you know, I had been learning for two years at the school with this Miller fix shade that's been passed down through 10 years of students. So there's this whole side is melted, you know, and the, you get one clear lens a year is what they would give us like a shield or for the outside, you know, the exterior, it was, uh, it was horrible. So they were pretty ecstatic when we <laughs> donated those. <laughs> yeah. But, so, yeah. Um, you mentioned Selstrom too. You know, the funny thing about Selstrom is the only person I hear vouch for Selstrom and hard vouch. He'll tell anybody, do you know who I'm talking about? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jesse McCollum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I've used one, you know, and for the price, you can't complain. It's, I, I think, you know, like with supplies in the store, I kind of need to have some variety. Um, as I said, everyone in San Antonio is a welder to some degree, or well, they know a welder. Uh, it's the epitome of, well, my buddy can do it cheaper. <laughs> um, <laughs> So many like you know weekend warriors doing it. They don't want to drop three four hundred bucks on a auto auto duck. Um, so we can get some stuff you know hundred and fifty ish give or take. I think that's going to sell better than a you know four hundred dollar hood. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And when you were talking about marketing for the shop, you know, like in San Antonio and Texas, there's so many welders, like you said. I think I would probably, well, this is kind of just a dream of mine. I want to host a welding competition, but to get it started, that would be kind of cool to uh, host a welding competition locally in San Antonio. And then, you know, everybody's coming out. The winner gets like a, you know, Man, whatever. We, we may get you on the payroll for marketing. <laughs> <laughs> I wish That's more funny. people did more welding competitions because I do feel like those are uh, a lot of fun, especially when I was in school. I wish we did more of them. Yeah. It was a good yeah, competition. We, we uh yeah, I remember we went down to Beloit and James, if you know Danea Bushcotter, she's in the Edge Army too. Uh yeah. She was actually the, the host of that one at, at that school. Um I don't remember the name of that school. It was Neither in Beloit, Kansas, but yeah. No, competitions are fun. Our next guest, Ty Linker, uh he's hosting one at Arkansas Elite Welding Academy with like a bunch of social media welders, like uh, Nate Montez, the owner of Slickman Glove. It's all oh. pipe welders though. It's just gonna be a lot of pipe welding, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> it is a pipe competition. Is it? Uh, okay, I, I didn't know what competition it was yet. Have, have you heard That's of- That's a good point. I'm gonna have to run with that. Have you heard of uh, Nate Montez with Slickman welding gloves? I've heard, I know the gloves, yeah. I've never, never spoken with him, but yeah. Oh. Nate's a really cool guy. Yeah, we had him on the podcast. He's out of Monahans, Texas, and um, he got his following. Not only his welds are insane. His stick welds are like I, I commented on that welding competition post. I said, "Let's get a betting pool going." I got Nate. I got oh, I got Nate all day against anybody. I got Nate. <laughs> but also his his catchphrase is like he'll say "right on the chili" when he shows his welds and stuff like that, or I. Yeah, where he starts the video, all right. <laughs> but, but his gloves are really nice. I made a video um, uh, with the – oh, I'm blanking on the name. It's his TIG gloves anyways. They're all white. And uh, I made a video picking up a 116th filler rod off the 
off the flat concrete floor and people kind of like that because of how huh. flexible those TIG gloves are. But, and then he'll sell like four pipeliners. If you're, if you're a right hand and your left hand's always on that, on that pipe resting, you know, you're, you'll burn up your left hand a lot more. So he'll sell a pair with two left hands and one right hand glove. That's just, I didn't know he sold that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but they're, they're pretty good gloves. Andy's pretty, I mean, I don't know how far Monahan's Texas is from San Antonio, but I'm, somewhat geographically challenged so i'll have to look that up <laughs> i know it's in west texas i know that just because you know that's like pipeline capital i mean you lived on a two thousand acre dairy farm and your direction challenged <laughs> yeah. but, uh, where's james i oh, fuck, fuck if i know he's somewhere <laughs> They also, as, as Brad White would say, it's also part of the Southern Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere situation going on. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had Brad on as a guest, too. How, how long have you known Brad? Because I saw you guys also made a video for Everlast, right? Some days it feels like I've known him way too long. Yeah, it's got to be five, six years. Because he's, he's literally like 20 minutes away from me just up the road. Um, yeah, we did a video yeah, years ago on the, the storm. Yeah. I think it was a storm, uh, which I knew him before that, but we actually, that was at the shop that I was meant, the big shop I was managing. We kind of capitalized on the camera crew. Um, Cause neither of us knew how to use a camera at the time. You know, we tried using a GoPro, shaky as all get out, and muffled audio. So, you know, Oleg wanted a video on it. I was like, well, bring it to the shop this weekend. I'll get one of the camera guys and audio guys to come hang out. I'll throw him some money to film it and edit it for us. Um, and which as, as you know, I mean, one of the biggest parts of it, you can film for two hours to get five minutes of content, but then you're spending another two, three hours editing. Yeah. Uh, which again, Brad and I didn't know how to do all that, you know, but <laughs> we've grown a little bit since then, as far as our skill set, but <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, capitalizing what we had at the time. Br Brad likes to give me shit about how young I am. Like at this past fab tech in Chicago, he would, uh, everybody called him my son or called him my dad and, and me his son. But so we'll clap back at him and call him old. <laughs> I, I can see the resemblance. How tall are you? 5'10". Uh, right. Brad's pretty so big. We should make, make the father-son image even more believable. <laughs> <laughs> He's a – hopefully I can live up to his welds. He, he goes all right. He goes all right. Yeah. For a grumpy old guy, he does okay. Yeah. <laughs> Emphasis on the grumpy. I know he's listening to this. <laughs> yep, he's going to. And by the way, Brad, I do talk sometimes. So you can give me all the oh, shit yeah. you want for that. But yeah, I do talk sometimes. <laughs> uh, James, earlier you mentioned welding titanium, chromoly, magnesium, and what was the other material? Uh, we also did some scandium out there. Um but I've, I've been blessed. I've welded pretty much every material. Uh, Inconel, Hastelloy, Monel, you know, duplex, double duplex. Um, as I said, I, the U.S. has been really good to me as far as shops I've landed in. So I've had a lot of variety. I'm, I'm curious. I've welded titanium, chromoly, uh, some of that stuff that you mentioned I never heard before. And... But what does magnesium weld like? It welds like, I mean, it welds like dirty, dirty aluminum. Um, almost like you got your polarity jacked up on your machine. It's, you know, I think you know, for me, that, that's the best description, dirty aluminum. Is, um, it, is it a DC process? AC. Well, oh, really? AC. Um, DC, you know, who is it? Niles, Niles Menzi that welds a lot of aluminum on DC um, because a lot of the work that he does 
it's an old, old well procedure and it calls for DC aluminum. Um, that's a trip. I've tried it a couple of times and I just, I don't know how he gets the welds that he does. Um, DC aluminum, the straight helium, it's hard. It's real hard. But he's got it perfected. Hmm. See, this is why I love the podcast because I can ask questions like that. So when I go to weld magnesium sometime, hopefully in my career, uh, then I can take this information. Well, who, who is it? RDA Fab out in Vegas that builds the hand trike, the hand trikes for uh, physically impaired people. He's the go-to guy for magnesium. I mean, he's got it so down. Um, the guy's a wizard. I don't know how he does it so well. Hmm. Well, James, we got about an hour of good footage. I didn't even look at my questions. This was great. We appreciate <laughs> you coming on, but here's something we ask every guest before we end the, every episode. What's your favorite genre of music to listen to while you work or weld? 90s rap, because I'm old. <laughs> 90s <laughs> rap, huh? <laughs> Not what I was expecting. Like like who? <laughs> like like uh, who? Uh Biggie, I mean, even going back past the 90s, Big Daddy Kane, man, Onyx. I was that, I was that white teenage kid in Australia listening to music that I had no place listening to. <laughs> and your Suzuki Samurai? That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Beautiful right there, huh? <laughs> We appreciate you coming on, James. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Everlast link for the upgraded Nova Torch and TIG pedal in the description. I'll put James in there, too, uh, just in case you want to pick or choose. That's all right. We'll put his social media links in the description as well. Edge Welding Cups, code BrenWell15. And Andrew? And head on over to SouthernLeatherworks.net for all your custom welding hood needs and custom belts as well. Um, thank you, James, so much for coming on. We really appreciate talking to you. Um, and we look forward to uh, talking to you again, hopefully. For sure. Appreciate you guys. Have a good day.